All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. It's great to see such a large turnout here for our third annual Data Fellows Program Showcase. My name is Stuart Campo, and I help coordinate the program here at the Center for Humanitarian Data. Somewhat exceptionally, based on what we've all been living through over the past several months, I'm joining you all from our offices in The Hague, but we are still very much working from home and remotely like all of you. I'll say a little bit more about how that has affected the fellowship program in a moment, but just to give you a sense of our program for today, we will mainly be hearing from the three data fellows. You'll hear about their projects during short Ignite talks and then have the chance to ask questions and hear more from them, both about the specific work that they've done and their recommendations for us as the center moving forward. We'll also have a broader panel discussion with the fellows to basically get their insights on what they've learned about how we work as the center and our broader network of partners as we look at solving problems with data in the humanitarian system. We began the Data Fellows program in 2018, and as I mentioned, this is our third class. This is, however, our first virtual class, as typically the fellows would be here with us residentially in The Hague for the summer. I have to admit that initially I was a bit concerned about trying to get so much done in such a short period of time remotely, but the three fellows, as you will see momentarily, have done absolutely incredible work. This year, as hopefully you can see on the screen, we've had three focus areas, predictive analytics, data storytelling, and statistics. Each year, we use the Fellows Program to expose the center and our partners to different areas of technical expertise that either we see relevance to our work with, or we'd like to have a better understanding of how to take advantage of to better solve problems that we're facing. As the Fellows share their projects with you, you'll see what they've already delivered, but also hopefully the potential to take this work farther. And that's really how we view this session. It's both a showcase of what the Fellows have already done and an opportunity to further connect and build partnerships through our network around the world as we work to increase the use and impact of data in humanitarian response. I'm going to give Nicholas a 10 second warning and hope that he's able to share his screen and then hand over so that we can start our presentations. So I'm very pleased to introduce Nicholas Bodenak, who is our Predictive Analytics Fellow this summer, who will tell you about his work exploring the use of predictive analytics in anticipatory action in the sector, and some of his recommendations for how we can carry this work forward. Nicholas, over to you. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, good evening or good morning, everybody, depending where you are. And uh, thanks for joining today. As Stuart said, my name is Nicholas Bodnack, and I was this year's Predictive Analytics Fellow. Uh, my research over the fellowship focused on essentially the processes and methods which go into utilizing predictive analytics within the humanitarian sector. Just a quick background about myself. Um, I'm an economist who's worked within the sector for about 10 years now. I'm currently working out of Beirut as the director for Mercy Corps' humanitarian access team for Syria. Um, so what is predictive analytics? Essentially, it's the use of past and present data to uh, develop forecasts essentially of what will happen in the future. And this is mainly developed through statistical methods, um, through machine learning, or through big data analysis. And within the humanitarian sector specifically, this is being used to, to gauge and measure the onset of, say, climate risk, uh, of conflict, of uh, migration movements, and as well as the spread of disease, to name a few. So the problem statement that I had for my research was understanding how humanitarian actors or organizations need to better understand and apply these particular methods in order to uh, more accurately deliver humanitarian assistance to populations in need. And to do that, I approached this by uh, engaging and interviewing a number of key stakeholders from organizations like the FAO, IFRC, START, uh, UN OCHA, obviously, and academic experts in the field. Um, I also reviewed a number of program materials and documentation from the above organizations and others related to the use of predictive analytics and, anti and anticipatory frameworks. Um, and as well as at a range of academic literature as well, looking into predictive analytics. So when we talk about predictive analytics within the humanitarian sector, we're essentially looking at, looking at this from the form of anticipatory action. And that's essentially developing a model which can measure a shock, essentially, or the predictability of a shock, which enables an organization to act before that event actually occurs. So if you can take an example uh, of, say, the onset of uh, a rapid flood, uh, a model could potentially um, 
bring about a, a, a probability that a flood will occur, say, within the next 10 days with a probability of 50%. Now, this may be what we call a trigger mechanism, in which case the, the trigger of a 50% likelihood will then lead to the activation or for the organization to act early upon that trigger. And this will lead, lead to the outlay of financial, a financial response or a program response, uh, which allows the organizational partner organizations to act be, or act before that particular crisis occurs, which allows them in turn to assist more people, to decrease costs, and as well as that, to decrease human suffering overall. So we developed a sort of research idea of this by trying to break down what the model cycle should be when developing a predictive model within these settings and to try and figure out along these specific, uh, these specific line items of an initiation, develop, validation, the application of the model and the maintenance, what particular processes and methodologies organizations should be implementing to ensure that the model is sound and the model is reviewed properly and that it's tied to a, to a sound response mechanism as well. We developed a number of visuals and mechanisms that go into asking key questions about what needs to be asked around these specific, uh, these specific processes, whether the, the landscape is actually usable for a predictive model, uh, if there's available data along that landscape, uh, what technical committees need to be implemented at certain times and what review processes also need to be implemented to ensure that the model is actually applicable and to ensure that we have these, as I said, uh, key financial mechanisms tied to the actual trigger mechanism. So from all of the individuals that we interviewed as part of this, there were some key observations and recommendations that I have, uh, which seem to be uniform across, across all of those. So the first one was that often within the sector, organizations seem to be jumping into the use of predictive modelings without actually defining the problem and understanding the landscape. Often organizations will decide to say develop a, a model based on migration patterns or perhaps on, uh, on, on drought mechanisms without actually trying to figure out how they will respond to this particular model. So understanding what the limitations are, what the frameworks are and how you can actually respond is integral to understand from the, from the first point. Second, this, there in, some, in some cases, there's insufficient expertise uh, for organizations to, to, to develop their own modeling. And this has led to a number of organizations to outsource or to partner with other organizations, which is an extremely good example of how this could be approached. Um, there are some circumstances where some organizations perhaps have tried to overly internalize these procedures without having the actual uh, expertise to do so, and it has led to inefficient outputs and less accurate modeling. So the idea of partnering up with other organizations, whether that be other humanitarian organizations or academic organizations or perhaps local governments can really increase this. Also to invest in terms of the long term for internal structures and internal knowledge retention as a lot of these, a lot of these risks and processes uh, are seasonal um, or systematic. So if we're looking at, for example, the onset of drought, these will obviously be an issue or the onset of a rapid flood, an issue which will be repetitive throughout seasons to come. Also, there's been a lack of local participation uh, in some instances for some organizations. And, and this has been something which has um, been brought in specifically within uh, a positive way from IFRC's forecast-based financing systems, which, which has, a, has a clause within their contracts that this has to have a lot of local participation involved in this process. Engaging with local partners and governments allows local ownership in the long term to start bringing in forecast-based systems within their own frameworks, but also allows country teams and, and headquarter offices to really engage in the developmental process of these systems, to understand what local dynamics need to be included within the model's development, and also to agree on trigger mechanisms which are in line with what your local partners are also developing. There's also been a lack of technical review uh, amongst a lot of organizations, uh, which is uh, a big aspect of what, of what the center has been pushing. So the center has developed, I think it was in March this year, a peer review framework, which was actually based on last year's predictive, um, predictive fellow um, on the research they conducted, which essentially shows specific processes which should be implemented to ensure that the models which are being developed are being reviewed properly to mitigate the risks and to increase their accuracy. So this is something which the sector as a whole really needs to start increasing on to ensure that there's a more viable approach to the model's accuracy. Further, uh, slow financial mechanisms are also a bit of a risk. So when, when a trigger is actually activated, ensuring that the processes which need to follow to ensure that the populations are actually reached in time need to be established prior to the model's activation. 
So establishing these financial plans and processes and procurement plans are integral. Otherwise, the model is essentially redundant. As one of the interview, interviewees stated that there's no point of having a model which is 100% accurate if it takes three months for the financial mitigation measures to actually be implemented. And finally, there's still a major gap of data. And when it, we, we're talking about predictive analytics and predictive modeling, they're only really as good as the data in which they feed into. So investing more money or investing more research into data collection methods, into areas which can bring about new, new forms of methodologies or perhaps new data that can increase the accuracy is integral, especially in low developed areas or remote areas. Thank you. Brilliant. Hopefully you can all hear me again. Nicholas, thank you for that. And thank you for that technical curveball where the screen share didn't work, but I think we managed to make sure that everybody could see your slides there. And it wouldn't be the moment we're all living through without a bit of technical difficulty. <laughs> so I should have mentioned beforehand that we're welcoming questions in the chat throughout the session. If you have any questions for Nicholas now, please drop them into the chat. We'll be monitoring that and bring those into our discussion in the second half of the showcase. For now, I will tell Karina to be on deck. Wonderful, and it looks like her screen is loading. Excellent. So next, we'll hear from Karina Demota, our data storytelling fellow, about the excellent work she's done on developing a Yemen data story. Karina, over to you. And Karina, we, I think you might be muted. Let's make sure that your audio is working. I think I was. So there we go. Lovely. Sorry. Back over to you. <laughs> Thanks. So as I was saying, this year's uh, fellow on data storytelling, uh, my name is Karina Demota. I'm Swiss German of origin and passionate about design and communicating about complex topics. And you can see a snapshot of what I would usually work on here in the screen. I'm also passionate about mountain sports and my two little boys. So my focus was on data storytelling, and this is really about the strategic use of visual and narrative storytelling te techniques to convey insights um, and catalyze action. So the idea really came from two existing data stories, one which was developed in 2018 by the um, data storytelling fellow back then, Hao Yun Su, on the displacement situation in South Sudan, and another one exists on the Central African Republic that was produced last year. And based on those two data stories, Ocha Yemen came up and, and mentioned that they were interested in producing something similar. So that's where it comes from. Storytelling is a bit of an overused term. It's been, you know, it's often associated, especially in the data community, often associated with creating just visually appealing information and design. But it's much more than that. It's actually a structured approach that uses human communication and combines it with the information so to allow for an immersive and somewhat different data experience than for instance a chart or an infographic would do. So it's about connecting, allowing users to, to connect to, to numbers and to a story at a deeper human level. So my focus this year was on Yemen and more specifically on finding a way to com communicate in a comp compelling and engaging way the severity and scope of the crisis in Yemen and at, and at the same time allow uh, audiences to actually understand what it means to be displaced in that context in order to mobilize additional resources and catalyze uh, compassion. In essence, the story has a couple of um, key components. Firstly, it usually has a main character or several main characters and a human perspective. In our case, this is Ali, Fariha and their kids. Those are fictive names, but the story is informed by a true, true story of displacement. Secondly, you would have a context and an incident that creates disruption. In our case, it's the conflict that broke out in Yemen in 2015 and the displacement situation and the displacement that it led to for Ali and his family from leaving Al Hudaida and then moving all the way down to Aden. Then there is a rising climax, so disruption comes with complication, and there is detail, so to allow audiences to really be drawn into the story and actually feel as if they were living the situation. In our, in our case, we tried to convey the hardships of what that family went through as they were displaced, as they were uh, going to a new location where they knew no one and where they didn't have a shelter, no food, no money, um, and to use data to really then link it up and speak to the scale and severity of the situation. 
In a typical story, you would have the ending saying they lived happily ever after. Unfortunately, in our case, that's not yet uh, the situation, but we're, we're hoping it will be at some, at some point. A story usually have some sort of, has some sort of an arc of suspense, uh, and what that aims to do is to, to foster some change, change in, in attitude, in feeling, in behavior, or in action. In our case, we're aiming for uh, catalyzing compassion and mobilizing funding. So this is what my work process looked like from online research and interviews that uh, ended up on sticky notes all over my, my home office place, all the way to sketches and drawing it out. And here is a bit of a flavor of the future data story. Um, you can see it's still uh, at the stage of mock-up. We're about to go into the building phase, but not quite there yet. So um, I'll just zoom in on, on a couple of elements. Here you can see the map, which is um, a centerpiece of the, of the story. So the map and the journey of displacement, which will in the future door, uh, story be animated and kind of guide the user from, from each place to the next and indicate um, what that means, zooming into each, each place to really draw audiences in. And this was actually quite so challenging and then really fascinating to do for me because I've never worked on, on map, uh, producing and stylizing maps. And I've I was new to Mapbox, which is the tool that we use for, for, this, uh, for this map. So it was really exciting. It also showed how sensitive it is to do data storytelling because in this case, we um, had to kind of think about how much of the journey can we actually, actually reveal, which level of detail can we provide can we go down all the way to the neighborhood level and we realized it was too sensitive. Similarly, for, for the narrative and the visuals that accompany and support it, it was um, really about striking the right balance because we needed to provide enough story and detail to draw users in and at the same time really um, make sure that we avoid to put anyone at risk. Probably the most interesting but also challenging bit was the data side of things, the data input. So. Um, Fascinating because it's all about making things visual and making insights more accessible. But it was also quite challenging in that um, there is a lot of data around about, about Yemen and the crisis, but some of it is outdated. Some of it is uh, rather sensitive and difficult um, to access. And some of it just didn't make sense in terms of I wasn't able to produce the visual that I was looking for in order to meaningfully support the, the story. What's the added value and for whom? So for the audience that this data story aims to reach, which in our case are the owners and the general public, we hope to provide a different type of data experience that's immersive and really links to the human beings behind the numbers. For the humanitarian data community and the center specifically, I think the data story offers a way to reach and engage with the audiences in a different way through data at a deeper and human level. And then ultimately, hopefully for the people in Yemen, it will also um, help generate additional funding to respond to the humanitarian crisis there. To finish off my, my um, Ignite um, presentation, a couple of recommendations from my side. Firstly, data storytelling is just one way of using narrative and visual approaches to, to convey insights and to reach audiences. It's a powerful one, depending on what you want to, uh, to, to achieve. And especially in today's digital world, it offers a, a huge amount of new possibilities. It's a powerful one, but you have to be strategic about it. It is uh, really an opportunity to foster new and uh, enhance existing partnerships. In our case, we collaborated with the Ocha Yemen team throughout um, uh, in an iterative, iterative process, and that was highly valuable. Um, so it's really a way to, to, to uh, generate and, and, and strengthen these partnerships. And thirdly, I would recommend to measure the use and impact of these data stories. Um, I think they're great, but it's also important to understand how uh, you know, the user behavior and how users interact with the story and better we uh, achieve the, the, the change and the action that we're aiming to trigger. And with that, thank you very much. And back to you, Stuart. Excellent, Karina, thank you so much for that. Very clear and I can tell, I think as we all expected that our audience is being a little bit shy or perhaps just taking the time to reflect. So just another reminder, feel free to drop any questions you have for the fellows into the chat. Otherwise we can take them on the fly once we move into the panel discussion shortly. So thank you, Karina and Carol, you are on deck. So our third presentation comes from Carol McInerney, who is joining us, it's worth mentioning, all the way from Australia. So this is perhaps 
not perhaps, definitely the latest a fellow has ever had to present their project output. So Carol, thank you for your patience and for the great work you've done this summer. And I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Carol McInerney, and I'm the Statistics Data Fellow. And the focus of my project has been understanding the mosaic effect in the humanitarian world. So I'll just start with a little bit about myself. I'm based, as Stuart said, in Melbourne, Australia, and I live here with my dog, Boots, and my partner, James. Outside of the fellowship, I work as a statistician with the Equality Insights team at the International Women's Development Agency. And this is a picture of a few of us on a particularly rainy International Women's Day this year. So what do I mean by the mosaic effect? Well, the definition that I quite like is that the mosaic effect is when disparate items of information can take on added significance when combined with other items of information. So one simple example in a humanitarian context would be, let's say you have one data set that describes conflicts and another set data set describing people in a refugee camp. If you were to link these two data sets together based on some common information, you may discover new, potentially very sensitive information. For example, you might learn about the location of a targeted minority group that were actually fleeing the conflict setting. And so you can see how this is analogous to a mosaic where one piece of broken glass, you know, it might not really give an observer much to look at, but when it's placed together with other pieces and in just the right way, this very clear picture emerges. So in order to make informed decisions about what data should be published and in what way, there is a need to better understand the likelihood and the potential impacts of the mosaic effect. And I just want to point out here also that there are many potential benefits to the mosaic effect. And by improving our understanding, we can both maximize those benefits and hopefully better minimize the risks. So the center began exploring this problem in collaboration with Delft University of Technology through a workshop that was run last month. And um, there was also recently a blog published by the data responsibility team that kind of outlines this work in a bit more detail. And so the focus of my fellowship was to take the learnings from the workshop and build on them to do a bit of a deeper dive on the topic. So what I learned in the exploration phase of my fellowship is that the first and pretty fundamental step to better understanding the mosaic effect is actually to understand the data environment. And what this means is basically to find or identify what data could potentially be used in a linkage attack. You know, what are those data sets that could be pieced together to form this mosaic and reveal those new insights? And we call this data environment analysis. So here I've used a network graph to visualize over 400 data sets that are all available on the Humanitarian Data Exchange or HDX. So in this picture, each of the nodes or the little dots represents one data set and each line um, or edge indicates if two data sets have variables in common. And you might call these variables or maybe column headers. And so you'll notice that you know, you can see a lot of connections here. And we actually found that over 90% of the data sets had variables in common with at least one other data set. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you, all of these data sets could be linked together, but it does show that there is potential for linkage. And I think that it provides a really tangible starting point for investigating the likelihood of the mosaic effect further. Now, HDX actually contains almost 20,000 data sets. And so trying to estimate the likelihood of the mosaic effect here is a bit overwhelming and just really not feasible for one person or even one organization. So I believe as the collection and use of data increases, data security, including the potential impact of the mosaic effect, is increasingly becoming pertinent to all humanitarians. So what I wanted to do was to create a tool to empower others to investigate and navigate this issue themselves. And since data environment analysis is the first and actually the most resource intensive step of the process, I wanted to automate as much of this as possible. 
So what you can see here, this is the tool that I built. It's essentially the same as the network on the previous slide. So again, the nodes represent data sets and the edges indicate if they have variables in common. But the difference here is that you can actually add your own data and find out where it fits in the HDX environment. So what you do is, as you just saw, you go and upload your data set using the upload bar. And then after it loads, um, it will appear in the network as this red dot. Um, and then what you can do is go and interrogate the network yourself and find out what are the data sets that it shares variables with and exactly what those variables are. So the fellowship went really quickly um, and there's still plenty of work to be done here. So my recommendations for the future are firstly to further develop the tool as it's currently just really a prototype and there's plenty of ways that it could be improved. Um, secondly, you may have noticed that the tool only actually uses the variable names from the data, none of the actual data itself. So those networks could be built just using that metadata. And so for those organizations who are looking to perhaps contribute data to HDX, they could see how their data fits in the HDX environment just by sharing their metadata. And finally, I think by the nature of this issue, it's one that should be continually revisited. This is a very dynamic problem space where new information, new data, new technology is always being added. And so the potential impacts are going to continue to evolve. So my final recommendation is to continue exploring the problem. And I also just wanted to end by saying that while it seems like, well, at least it seems to me like this is quite a big, almost overwhelming topic, we're not alone. So there are many others in many different fields, all facing very similar situations, and we can all learn from each other. So if there's anyone who's interested in sharing their own experiences, or maybe even in contributing to this exploration by testing out the tool with some of your own data, then please reach out to the center. Thank you very much. Carol, thank you so much. That was a great cap to the three presentations and I can see the questions are starting to roll in. So I'll do the best I can to monitor the chat and we'll take uh, kind of batches of questions as they come in before we move into a slightly more general conversation. Hopefully, I'm not totally sure what you all can see, but hopefully you'll be able to see our fellows as they respond to your wonderful questions. Also, just a note, I see that the first question that came in about sharing data and other reports um, from Argentina, my colleague Javier has answered not only clearly, but in Spanish. So thank you, Javier, or gracias. That's about the limit of my Spanish. So I was worried about tackling that one. But um, we'll then start with a question for Karina. And actually I'm going to join this first question from Gagan and the question from, uh, Chad Hendricks, CJ, about uh, basically picking content, sensitivities around content for storytelling, et cetera. So for colleagues who perhaps can't see the chat, I will just read these questions so that we're all following along together. And then Karina, I'll hand over to you. So Gagan, who also is actually an alumni of the program, great to see you on here, Gagan, is asking, how do you feel about the kinds of graphic images of the Yemen conflict shown in the mainstream media? Does it add to a data story or hamper its narrative? And he's acknowledging this isn't necessarily totally related to your talk, but he's interested in your opinion. And then relatedly from CJ, he says he'd imagine that the kind of concerns about data protection and data storytelling are in some ways similar to the concerns we have about data responsibility in general, including, for example, the mosaic effect. But it also seems like you might have the concerns that a journalist would have about protecting sources. So is that a useful way of thinking about it? So to summarize, Karina, how do we think about the use of different types of media or content more broadly in storytelling? And then relatedly, what is the perspective that we can take to kind of navigate sensitivities and decisions that we're making? Thanks, uh, Stuart Gagan and um, Chad. Thanks a lot for the questions. Both really, really relevant ones. And um, I actually did, um, it's something I thought a lot about while building the data story on Yemen. So to the first one, more broadly speaking, I think it really comes down to what, um, whom you're trying to reach and what your objective is with that audience. I'm not, um, you know, 
judging what media do or not. It's more for me about um, what do you want to what do you want to achieve with your communication, and is the way you do it is the, is the, the storytelling and the narrative that you build does that kind of help you achieve this goal and and reach that audience for. Um, for the data story on Yemen, it proved to be quite sensitive. As I think, uh, Chad, you mentioned later on, there is this element about data responsibility and the mosaic effect. It's something that I, I found striking while, while working on a data story on Yemen, because then um, you have the narrative with information, you underpin it with data and with visuals that kind of all comes together and can build a bit of a, a sensitive um, story. So you have to be very careful um, and work it out in terms of how much detail can you provide on the on the journey, on the family itself, on what they go through, whom they meet, what they kind of live, their lived experience. And to me, it really is closely linked to data responsibility. So not only data responsibility about the data that we're including, but also the information we put into the narrative and, and the pictures. I hope this answers your questions. Thanks so much, Karina. That was very clear and I think comprehensive. So hopefully if colleagues have follow-up questions, they can drop them into the chat and otherwise we'll move to the next question. So Wilhelmina from GIPS, great to see you on the line. You've posed this question to all three of our fellows. I think for now I'll direct it to Nicholas and have him sort of speak from the perspective of what he learned in his research about the use of predictive analytics. So Nicholas, the question is about the importance of understanding the data landscape or ecosystem, and basically what have you found in terms of approaches or techniques to gain this understanding? I know in your research that you heard from a lot of colleagues about the paucity of data or incompleteness of data, particularly when we're thinking about modeling and the requirements to do modeling at a sort of comprehensive or rigorous level enough to inform decisions. So could you speak to Wilhelmina's question about how one might go about understanding that landscape, perhaps broadly, but also in the context of predictive analytical modeling? That's yeah, a very, uh, very good question. Um, so yeah, the, one of the key components which sort of came out from our research was that there was obviously limitations in terms of some aspect, and, and it also depends on what sector we're looking into about the sort of modeling techniques. So. Um, Organizations like FAO, for example, who didn't have the capacity to really internalize a lot of their own approaches in terms of looking at issues to do with the onset of drought would externalize or look for uh, either proxy data or looking to what was actually already being gathered from other, other agencies such as IRI who are doing, say, meteorological data gathering and then bringing that into their own data sources if that's available. Um, if that's not available, then there's also there's also the possibility of perhaps even looking at more traditional methods of, of data gathering. So looking at baseline assessments, for example, before a model is actually predicted, try to gauge what is actually happening within local communities, depending on how localised the models are actually going into. Um, one of the aspects I think that I think needs to be flagged is that if there is if there is a significant data gap altogether, there are very much there is very much a limitation in terms of where a predictive model can actually come into, how much historical data is actually there and available. And there are perhaps some methodologies which can go in to try and fill that gap uh, and to try to build on what is actually available, but it is it's still quite limited. So I would even suggest that in certain circumstances, there is more of a concerted effort to maybe look into how to gather new data um, as a starting point to ensure that future applications of predictive analytics can, can potentially be used in those circumstances. Um, as opposed to trying to rush in and find kind of questionable or incorrect data that will then go into sort of predicting something as serious as, say, a climate shock, which would effectively be incorrect. Thank you, Nicholas, for this. And I know it, it was clearly mentioned in your recommendations that organizations continue to invest in this area. So we'll certainly take your guidance on that. Next, we'll move to a set of questions for Carol. So I'm going to take Craig's two questions and then also the question from Brian here. And Carol, feel free to kind of address them in parts as you see fit. So Craig is first asking uh, whether you found any specific, potentially sensitive examples of the mosaic effect when looking through data on HDX. And what do you see as the implications for HDX or other agencies making large amounts of data public? And then relatedly, 
uh, potentially malicious actors may have access to their own data that could be combined with humanitarian data sets to create negative mosaic effects. Is it in any way feasible to consider this factor when reviewing the potential sensitivity of data that humanitarian agencies share? And I know we've thought and talked a lot about this this summer, Carol, so I'm eager for you to share your thoughts with the broader group. Just relatedly on this, maybe as part of the explanation, Brian's question is about um, the distinction between data sharing variables versus sharing the values of those variables. How can you describe or use both of these in terms of like methods for seeing the effect? I realize that was a lot, Carol, so be feel free to ask me to repeat any of that as needed. Thanks very much, Stuart. I, I was writing a few of them down, so um, hopefully I won't need to. But yes, yeah, so in terms of specific examples, um, I did do a bit of a case study as well. Um, and that was looking at kind of actually looking at the data itself rather than just the variables. And so I was looking at one um, publicly available data set on HDX and then one also private from one of the partners and looking at trying to find linkages there. Um, I, I did find some linkages and, you know, that you can be fairly confident about the that they are probably referring to the same unit of analysis. Um, but I think that there's always, you know, there's always going to be a level of uncertainty there. And I was mainly kind of concentrating on trying to find what particular variables as well are, you know, the ones that might be more risky. Um, and so I was looking at households and so I was looking at kind of the household attributes um, and also there's often information more detailed information about the head of household um, so yes I found a, a bit <laughs> um, and then also in terms of that malicious actors may have their own data yeah I think that this is so that's also kind of typically part of the data environment analysis you know you would go broader beyond um, just the HTX environment looking further afield and you know sometimes mm -hmm. people even do assessments including like information from news articles and other like um, you know less formalized sources of information. Um, I think that you know I think that there's always going to be those unknown unknowns you know you don't you won't be able to know all of the data that a malicious actor might have access to. So I think that um, you also have to maybe consider that in your risk assessment as well, that you probably don't know everything. So, um, yeah, I think there will always be a level of uncertainty. And then finally about looking at the, the data itself. So, um, yeah, absolutely variables, having variables in common certainly doesn't mean that you you can actually link up the data sets. Um, you have to look at the actual values to do that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, ideally, you know, you could automate it all and just go and have a computer look to see if there are matching um, values within the variables. But I think that we're probably not at that stage at the moment in that, there's quite a bit of harmonizing that needs to be done between the data sets to actually find variables that are comparable um, or values that are comparable. And also, um, no, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'll finish there. Thanks so much, Carol. It's a complex topic and that was very clear. There are a few more questions for you in the chat. So maybe have a look at those while we move to the next question for Karina and then uh, we can come back to some of these points. Colleagues, we do still have a bit of time, so feel free to drop questions in. We'll try to address as many of them as we can. Just acknowledging that I've seen Joe Crawford's question, but I'll answer that uh, a bit later in the session, and we'll just try to work through as many of these as we can. So I'd like to go back to Karina from a data storytelling perspective and maybe ask a different version of the question from Wilhelmina, which was about understanding the data landscape broadly. I remember a discussion early in the fellowship with you about how there's been quite a lot of coverage of the crisis in Yemen broadly, quite a lot of data visuals, quite a lot of narrative and, and photo-based communication. So how did you approach looking at the 
the broad space of data and content around Yemen and then start to hone in with our colleagues from Ocha Yemen and other collaborators on what you believe should be in this data story that you've been working on throughout the program. So yes, it was it was a bit challenge because there is a lot out there and yet so many um, different challenges that came up along along the process. So um, to get a bit of an overview, so to understand the ecosystem, I first had to simply kind of do online research and um, um, I put it all on, on, on a visual map act, uh, actually to try to understand where I could find what, typically looking at HDX, at H, uh, the humanitarian needs overview reports and humanitarian uh, response plans. And then from that kind of looking at um, next level uh, data. As the data story in Yemen started to shape up with the narrative, the story of displacement of this this family, uh, Ali, for and their kids, I started to kind of um, uh, go deeper and based on the story and based on the current kind of biggest issues and needs, I tried to kind of um, zoom in on specific uh, data inputs that could support that story. So it's not aiming to provide a holistic uh, um, overview of uh, data and um, knowledge that we have from that data uh, on Yemen and the crisis there. It's really just providing a snapshot. It's, it's providing a snapshot in time um, that is kind of linked to the current biggest needs and uh, what is going on in Yemen. Um, but it's by no means providing a holistic kind of view on, of that crisis. And then maybe the last bit to that question is that I also realized I really had to go into exploring. And um, data story will be very different from creating a dashboard, from creating an infographic, or simply producing charts. Um, in, my, in my case, I really had to go into exploring, testing kind of rapid visualizations and seeing if that made sense from, from the perspective of the narrative that I had at hand and the objectives that we had set out to, to achieve. Um, so in some cases, I tested out things and ended up not using it because I felt it didn't support the story or it didn't. Uh, I realized the data didn't allow for that type of uh, visual to be pr produced because the data was collected in different ways, the methodology that was used, or because it wasn't up to date, or for other reasons. So it was really an iterative and um, testing um, approach. Over to you, Stuart. Thanks, Corinna. Again, very clear and I think helpful for us to keep in mind as the center, as we think about data storytelling as something that we do see great value in and, and trying to find the place where we can invest in this work um, more going forward. Nicholas, I'll come back to you. And there are two questions that I'll link together. So the first is from Baukia asking about from your interviews, are there any best practices on partnering or interagency cooperation that you could highlight to inspire and inform other organizations moving forward? And then perhaps relatedly, but I definitely should not presume, the question from Craig about the most impactful real world example of predictive analytics that you've found or heard about in your research. So over to you, Nicholas. Sure. Excellent. I think I can probably merge those into one question, uh, into one, one response. So um, is a particular example in which uh, you and Archer has recently implemented uh, in conjunction with uh, WFP, um, FAO and FPA uh, regarding floods, a flood warning system essentially in Bangladesh. Um, and there was a system which was essentially put in place where um, OCHA had implemented a, a, a system which was obviously following a, ra a range of sort of research methods which, which were conducted again in the local area to see how the best practices or best approach could, could be developed. And essentially it was decided that uh, due to uh, the particular modeling constraints and response constraints that flood warning systems were basically the best way in which these particular mechanisms could be implemented. Um, from that, there was a dual trigger system which was developed, um, and this included uh, bringing in a model which was essentially developed from the EU into Bangladesh into, for that particular case study, uh, using uh, data which had been gathered from the local government to fill into that model and recalibrating that particular model with a technical committee from all the organisations involved, and IFRC as well, I think. Uh, to recalibrate that for the local context. And they developed a dual kind of trigger system so that there would be an initial warning uh, 10 days out 
that there would be a risk of a flood occurring within that um, that particular area, in which case I think there was $5 million worth of surf funding, which was automatically allocated, I think, within four hours of that warning system. And that went into a secondary warning system, which was triggered for, I think, five days out, uh, suggesting there would be a severe flood within five days, and in which case all of those partner agencies of WFP, FPA and FAO essentially were able to then mobilise their procurement from that particular funding mechanism um, and assist the populations in need before the actual event struck. And I think from, from memory, I think 25,000 people uh, gained assistance. I think from uh, WFP alone, there was a cash, cash disbursement mechanism there um, that went into that. So I think that was a really key one because it brought in both local participation from the local government, coordination from OCHA, three implementing organisations, but as well as that, I think expertise as well in the design and modelling development as well from IFRC, who had already had cash-based systems in the region. So um, that's kind of like, a, I think, a really good example, which shows, for one, a really good current example of a model which has been implemented, which had a significant effect, but also how it was conducted with a range of organisations to collaborate as opposed to just one focusing on one issue. Great, Nicholas. Thank you for that. And I think good that we could see you there. So we're coming near the end of the session. We've got 10 minutes left. I have a few questions that I'll bring together for Carol, and then we'll kind of have a, a bit of a group reflection for the last bit. So thank you all for your great questions. We can, of course, find a way to follow up on some of the questions we might not have gotten to offline and really appreciate all of your interest in the fellow's work. So, Carol, I'll go through them and again, happy to repeat as necessary. The first is from Gagan about whether there is any study or empirical work showing when a publicly available data set has actually been used to identify people. Second, from Baukia is somewhat related. Are there examples of the mosaic effect being noted and in informing policy or operations in limiting the duplication of efforts and or enhancing cooperation in information management? That is a mouthful, but basically have you seen sort of references to the mosaic effect actually being addressed in policies or operations? And then finally, uh, from Sebastian, uh, could you quantify to what extent the addition of a certain data set to the, the platform, presumably HDX or your tool, um, has utility for humanitarian action or possibly dangerous effects? And I don't think the question is for you to actually quantify that, but just to say whether or not that might be possible. So those three back over to you, Carol, and then we'll move into the final bit of the session. And Danny, just so you're aware, I've seen your question and that will start us off for the group discussion. Thanks, Stuart, um, and thanks for your questions. Yeah, so on the actual examples of sort of data, the mosaic effect being used in like an actual piece of evidence showing that it's been used for sort of by a bad actor. Um, I do know of one here in Australia was, um, we have like our public healthcare systems called Medicare and they released a sample of their data publicly. And, um, it, you know, it, everybody thought that it was sufficiently anonymized and all of that. And, um, you know, they obviously deemed it to be safe enough to release publicly, but then it was actually, um, luckily it was a, you know, a benevolent person from a university went ahead and they were able to re-identify medical practices and find out quite a lot about um, their patients and stuff. And so, yeah, there have been examples of, um, of this happening. I think the thing is, is that, you know, if you actually have a genuine malicious actor, you probably won't know. You won't know that it's happened. So I think that that is... It, it kind of, by the nature of it, it's difficult to know how much this is happening. Secondly, examples about um, informing policy. Um, I Is this kind of, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, is it that it's kind of um, examples of it for good, kind of data, data linkage for good? Yeah, my sense, Carol, is that it's really about have you seen an organization acknowledging and incorporating measures that would either mitigate or positively capitalize on the mosaic effect? 
Yeah, sure. Um, well, I actually have some experience working more in the health sector. So this is the Centre for Health Record Linkage. And record linkage is in itself quite a big field. And, you know, it's obviously very intimately related to the mosaic effect. It's essentially the same thing, but kind of coming at it from a different perspective. Um, you know, this that type of data linkage for good is done under very controlled settings. There's lots of sort of um, governance around how that's done. Um, but yeah, there's certainly, I know in the health sector who are quite advanced in terms of uh, looking quite deeply into this topic, they do certainly mm -hmm. use this for good. Um, they use, they link up data sets to do more research and look at how like health outcomes impact education outcomes by linking those two data sets together. So it is certainly used there. Um, I think in terms of mitigating the mosaic effect, the, a good example is the centre. They do their statistical disclosure control, which is, it it does in fact like mitigate the risks of the mosaic effect, um, because it is providing some anonymizations. It makes a lot of assumptions about the data environment, um, but it it is mitigating those risks. And finally, the question about oh yeah, um, I think yes, it, I think this is a great question and. Um, really highlights this tension between risk and utility. And I think that in the humanitarian world, this tension is particularly intense. You know, there's there's huge, like very, very strong arguments for having data, timely data, readily accessible. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of hard to argue with that. But then also, you know, we really want to make sure that we are mitigating as much risk as possible. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, um, yes, I think that there is there is still uh, a bit of work to be done to better understand how these data sets are being used. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Carol. And I'm mindful of time. So we are going to move fast and try not to break things. But we'll answer Danny's question in a quick round for each of the three fellows. And then I have one question. And I will make sure to cover the two questions that have come in about what the center will do building on the fellows work. So Carol, maybe I'll stay with you just a quick reaction. I know you haven't had a time to think about this. But Danny's question is, how has being in the fellowship during a global health crisis affected how you've approached this work? Yeah, I, uh, it's a good question, I think. I mean, obviously, um, it's different working from home and uh, all of that. But I think in terms of approaching the project, um, I think that you're actually seeing in the data that's available, you know, you have data related to the pandemic, and that's obviously very timely. And I think that the, the pandemic is sort of speeding up the already increasing rate of data use and data sharing. And so I think that the it's, yeah, it, it makes kind of the topic even more important. And I think that um, there is also, as there, you know, probably always is in the humanitarian world, this real drive to ha have access to data, it, it's still important to be considering, considering the risks. So um, I'm glad that it was a, a topic. Great. Karina, over to you. Same question. Thanks. Yeah, I think aside from the personal aspects of having to work from home and not having this in-person exchange, you know, spot on with, with colleagues, uh, Carol and Nicholas, aside from that, I think it impacted me or the, the fellowship work in, the, in terms of everything now being online. So all the research uh, was done online as opposed to maybe otherwise having been able to kind of go and grab some books and stuff like that. And then uh, all the sticky notes being all over my place instead of the office as well. But I think um, the main impact might be on the story itself because now there is also this angle of COVID. And with that, the you know, you can't include that in a in a kind of static manner. You have to find ways to include it in a, in a dynamic manner so that the uh, the data is being updated so that um, that's perhaps a new kind of um, aspect to it. Absolutely. And it's something we'll continue to grapple with. Nicholas, a quick answer to that same question. Sure. Um, 
I don't think it really impacted the okay, I think processes that much, to be honest with you. I think obviously there was more uh, sort of uh, use of Skype as a communication tool as opposed to knocking on somebody's door. Um, but other than that, I think it, it really didn't have much of a, a impact in terms of the overall quality. Um, it was interesting though, similar conversations, uh, as, sorry, similar statements as what was stated before that given the fact that there are obviously currently predictive models coming out about COVID, it just, I think it made it kind of somewhat more relatable when reading methodologies about how these were being uh, implemented kind of while you're currently going through an epidemic kind of like this as well. So um, yeah, I think that would probably be my, my take from it. Brilliant. So fair warning, I'm gonna go from Nicholas to Karina and Carol with a one sentence reply to the following question. What is one topic or area that the center should cover in next year's Data Fellows program? While you prepare your very short answers, I'll answer the two questions about where we go from here. So each year the center receives the final outputs and deliverables from the fellows, which always include recommendations, both specific to the projects they've delivered, as well as the broader area of technical expertise. In the case of each of the projects this year, we see a clear path forward. In the case of the data story, we'll continue working with Ocha Yemen to build that out based on Corinna's great work and aim to launch that later this year. With Nicholas's work, that will be a public report that we'll be launching and that our team lead for predictive analytics, Leonardo, will also carry forward with his peers working around anticipatory action and the use of predictive analytics therein. And for Carol's work, my team, the data responsibility team, along with other parts of the center, will continue to explore taking that third recommendation very seriously and also start to work with other partners, both in terms of how the technical tool can be used, but also how we can assess this risk more broadly. So back over to Nicholas for your one sentence topic that we should cover in next year's program. Uh, um, how to... I would say how to mitigate data gaps for predictive modeling. I think that was a big issue, which all the people that I interviewed brought up, and I think is a really important thing for people to focus on. Great. Noted. Karina. Explore innovative approaches, especially in today's digital world, that offers a whole uh, vast array of possibilities. And link to that, since it's exploratory, to use user research in parallel. Awesome. Also noted. And Carol. Uh, yeah, I think that data responsibility is all about managing the risk versus utility trade-off. And I've been looking at the risks, so I think it would be great to dive deeper into the utility. Ooh, that's a good challenge and something we definitely don't do enough of, so also noted. Carol, Corinna, and Nicholas, thank you. It has been such a pleasure to work with you all over the past two months. I can't believe we're at this point in the program, but we know that we'll stay connected with you and still be able to build on your projects in the months ahead. You've given us energy and inspiration, which are both in short supply right now. So we really appreciate your commitment to our mission to increase the use and impact of data in the sector. And we look forward to continuing to work with you all moving forward. Thanks to everybody who's joined. We really appreciate the interest in this work from our community. And if you want to apply for next year, we'll do our best to announce that before the end of the year, which is a promise I will try to keep. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a great day, evening, and take care. Have a great day. Bye.